welcome to Google Talks. Uh, my name is Kate Johnson. I'm Glo Global Marketing Director of Sports and Entertainment um, here at Google. I am also a former Olympian. I competed in the 2004 oh. Olympic Games in rowing. Yeah. Um, and I'm very excited to be hosting this panel for you guys today. What we're like, you know, almost, we're coming up on 12 days out from the closing ceremonies of the Paris Olympics. So I'm thrilled to be able to host this incredible panel today. I'm going to have each of these outstanding athletes introduce themselves. And I want you to share, you know, the, the, the quick hits on obviously your athletic career, but the, the but also your life after sport. Um, so Angela, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Thanks for having us, first of all. Um, I'm Angela Ruggiero. I was a four-time Olympian in women's ice hockey. So I represented Team USA in uh, Nagano, we had a gold, silver in Salt Lake, uh, bronze in Torino, and finished my career with the silver in Vancouver. Um, so played 16 years on the national team. Um, Post-career, uh, I uh, went back to business school, um, spent eight years on the International Olympic Committee, uh, which put me on the board of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee as well. Um, and then I started a company called Sports Innovation Lab. It's a fan data company that helps drive uh, sort of data-driven strategies in the sports industry. So, um, been, you know, love sports, still involved in sports, um, have two sons, run around like crazy on hockey weekends doing hockey practice now. Totally. Um, but just, uh, yeah, the, the Olympic movement is part of my DNA. I love it. Love that. Hi, guys. I'm Missy. I am an Olympic swimmer. I competed in 2012 and 2016. I have five gold medals and one bronze, and uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and now I am a wife and a mother of a daughter who just turned three, her name is Caitlin. So that side of life has been absolutely wonderful, but since retiring, uh, gotten into many different things, toes in many different waters, so to speak, <laughs> but philanthropy has been very, very important to me. So I am co-chair of the global board for the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation, which was started by Nelson Mandela, and we fund projects globally that use sports to uplift youth in their communities. And I'm also part of the USA Swimming Foundation, which is the philanthropic side of USA Swimming, and we focus a lot on preventing drowning, um, which is actually an epidemic in this country that a lot of people don't realize. So a lot of work around that. I do a lot of speaking, getting to share my story, and have a heavy emphasis on mental health. So just really excited to be here with you guys today. And I'm not going to let you off the hook yet. You have to mention your podcast. Oh, and I, and I co-host a <laughs> podcast. I always forget this one. Yeah, so I started a <laughs> podcast earlier this year with fellow Olympian Katie Hoff. It's called Unfiltered Waters. And we have athletes of all sports, uh, of course, a heavy emphasis on swimming, but we have all different athletes on to share their true and authentic story and really get to know the person behind the athlete so we can all kind of have that deeper emotional connection to them and also understanding and empathy with them as they go throughout their careers and experience the ups and downs. Uh, yes, please clap. Please clap. It's hard That's not awesome. to clap. Um, my name is Ashton Eaton, and I am a gold medalist in the decathlon from London 2012 and Rio 2016. Um, yeah, I am from Oregon, which is where I currently live with my wife and two kids. My wife is also a, an Olympic bronze medalist in the heptathlon um, from Canada. We met at the University of Oregon. Go Ducks! Thank you. Fantastic. Um, after we're retiring from sport, uh, after Rio, I worked at Intel for a few years in their Olympic Technology Group, where we did uh, 3D uh, motion analysis for athletes using com computer vision and AI. And I got a degree in mechanical engineering. And now I work at Nike as um, an R&D innovation engineer. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also a, an advisor on what's called the WUSAI Human Performance Alliance. And it's five universities um, around the country, along with uh, some other companies where we use uh, research data to actually try to improve human health by studying what makes elite athletes elite and try to bring those insights uh, into the health industry. Amazing. Well, thank you. And thanks so much for being here today, you guys. Um, we all four were in Paris, actually, at the at the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. I thought we would start with kind of a warm up on, you know, what was one either wonderful memory or takeaway that kind of caught you by surprise just from your experience in Paris. Angela, let's start with you. Uh, well, I'm on the board of World Rugby, so I have to give them a little credit. <laughs> uh, it, it just the coming of age of Rugby Sevens. Um, oh, cool. Rugby was reintroduced um, in 2016, but you know, didn't I, I think it was just sort of finding its feet 
And then, of course, with um, COVID, it, it was hard for any of the sports. Uh, but we were able to pack three f three days for the men, three days for women in the large stadium there, Stade de France. Um, for the Rugby Sevens, the American women won the bronze medal. Um, oh, cool. I actually got to help give the medals out, which was so fun for me. But, um, yeah, it was just seeing the, the atmosphere, the – France on the men's side won the gold. Um, so it was one event, but it, I think it was a um, representative of the games, just the power of of the Olympic movement in its full force. Like everyone was like, whoa, the Olympics. And it's almost like it just like came back on and rugby was a big, you know, a piece of that. Um, but the venue and the, and, the, and the French people were so proud. I remember mm -hmm. like the feeling in the venue and you have like 90,000 people seeing their, you know, seeing their team win. I mean, it's just like euphoric. Um, yeah. So just being a part of that and being in that venue in particular was uh, memorable for me. So cool. Yeah. Just going off of that, which is I, uh, ironically, I, this may not sound very American to start, but I promise it will. One of my favorite moments, <laughs> I went to swimming, okay. right? <laughs> I went to swimming every single night, but being in La Défense Arena, when Leon Marchand, who was like the breakout swimmer, and of course he's French, when he was winning his gold, I was there the night that he doubled and won gold in the two fly and the two breast, and it was just like and nothing I've ever experienced. I mean, truly the pride, like having everyone in there singing the French national anthem, like it was just so beautiful, but it got me so excited for LA and so excited for our athletes to be in a home crowd and to know that like that's what they're going to be experiencing so it was really cool to experience that the French pride the pride they had for their athletes who did so well and then also to carry that excitement to know that we only have four years before we get to have that here if I can add so I was in the stadium the BMX stadium <laughs> when the French won three medals <gasps> I don't know if anyone saw that. And uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president, literally sat right here behind me. <laughs> Good seats. So I'm in a lot of photographs, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but to your point, like the venue was just crazy and the French president was there and it's this, this like pride for their country. But to your point, LA, four years around the corner. Um, yeah, that's what it's about. It's so, it's so cool to be a part of that though, even if you're not from the country. I know, I know. Actually, my story, dovetails off all this and uh, with Missy's story because I was in the track stadium mm -hmm. um, one night and the men's decathlon 400 meter was about to start and there was no French athlete in that race and uh, but the crowd was still like kind of bubbling up and getting loud and the the uh, announcer was even like hey can everybody please be quiet so these athletes can start their race <laughs> and nobody listened to him so it was like 70,000 people in the Stade de France were just getting louder and louder and I'm like looking around everybody's looking around what's going on and then you see people are on their phones. And Leon Marchand is actually <laughs> winning the 200. Oh. Oh, and so wow. we're in the track stadium and everybody is singing the French national an anthem and going nuts and then he wins and everybody erupts. And it was like, I can't, this is like the power of sport. Like here we are, this guy is like across the street in the swimming hall, but we're all in here cheering for him. Uh -huh. um, and eventually everybody quieted down and then the race had to start. But to me, that was a moment where I was just like, this is so incredible. So incredible, I mean, and, and it was amazing because I think Paris did such a good job. You know, we, I've heard a few people say that like Paris was like the, the fifth Olympian or the third Olympian in the performances just because of the backdrop that they provided. I think the other thing they did phenomenally well were, was the Easter egg. And, and Easter egg is like a term we use here at Google. Google actually had a really important role in the Olympic movement. If you can imagine, every day you went on to Google to search for results. We had a different doodle for all 17 days of the games. And one of my favorites was around the track and field bell that they were ringing. Did you guys remember, did you hear where they're going to put that bell at the end of the games? They're hanging it in Notre Dame. So when the cathedral is done being refurbished, this bell that these track and field athletes from around the world ring will hang in the cathedral, which I just think is like, I mean, that was Paris. So the understanding history, understanding the importance of the moment and stepping into it just so gracefully and elegantly and fashionably. Oh, it was amazing. Speaking of fashion, Angela, um, why don't we turn to the shirt that you're wearing? Can you tell us a little bit about this shirt and like one of your other many ventures that you're doing and what we did with that? Yeah, so, um, uh, gender equality is super important to me. Being, coming from a male-dominated sport, um, 
we've had to always sort of fight for our right to belong. And um, and when I was on the IOC, I was the chair of the Athletes Commission there, um, and was able to initiate the Gender Equity Review Project. Uh, it was about eight years ago now. Um, the culmination of that is what we saw in Paris, where we finally had 50% equal participation of male and female athletes at the Paris Olympics, which was so important. I think we always juxtapose men versus women in sport, and here you have this like global brand that is probably the biggest sports brand in the world, it's men and, and women. Um, so wanted to sort of stamp that um, with something fun, and we're in the capital fashion of the world in Paris. So said, why don't we, why don't I throw a fashion show um, to celebrate gender equality? So um, created a brand called For the Walk, um, which created some interesting pieces around just expressions of equality and had beautiful, smart, fantastic 24 female Olympians walking, one to my left, one to my right, <laughs> walked in the show. But it was, um, it was just fun. I mean, it was about, it was just to celebrate the moment and, um, and do, just do it in a really authentic yeah. way. My experience of that was incredible. I I followed Janet Evans on the on the walkway, right? Who I who grew walked up it with just, her daughter, who walked which it was with amazing. her daughter, whose name's Sydney, and there is relevance there because of where Janet swam, right? Um, and then was followed by Don Staley, who like was wearing a shirt that said "Role Model." So anyway, forthewalk.com, check it out, get the merch. It's amazing. I'm, a, I mean, and so classic that Olympian would like start a company at the Olympics and a fashion show all in one. <laughs> kind of like understated here too. I just want to say is that. Angela, can you just mention a little bit about your role at the IOC and like the vision for gender, gender equality, equal Olympics? Yeah, I think in anything in life, you just have to be very intentional. Um, and women's sports were slowly sort of gaining a foothold in the Olympic movement. But there was never um, an audit, if you will. And I spent, uh, I, was, I was a president of the Women's Sports Foundation. It's actually where I met Kate for the first time. We were waiting in line for this event. Um, but if you think about Title IX here in America, um, there's so many other areas outside of participation that if you actually like took a second to look at, you can you could you could improve. And so we did an audit basically of the Olympic movement. And this is every sport, every country. Um, how can we be better as a as an organization? Mm -hmm. And that filters into the federations, the National Olympic committees, and then ultimately to the athletes and the fans, right? The little boys and girls that are watching at home, um, which to me is such an important piece of this. So um, yeah, when I was on the IOC said, why don't we, if we really care about gender equality, let's really look at it and try to make it better. Um, participation is the most obvious because it's super visible, but there's so many other areas of opportunity that um, we wanted to highlight in this, uh, this study, so. Cool. Yeah. We got a gender parody Olympics because Angela tasked the IOC with making sure it happened. Let's go. Like, big round of applause for that. Yeah. Um, Ashton, you were very understated in the mentioning of your like back-to-back -back Olympic champion status. And I we had an interesting conversation just in prep for this discussion, which was kind of around, um, and it's an interesting time at Google, right? Like we hear a lot of this language around meet the moment, the AI moment. Um, and there's a lot of longtime Googlers here who have, um, you know, experienced one version of Google. And now we have this total moment of disruption that's happening that we're all asking to rally around, including people that have come to Google from the outside and are, are in this together. And I think there's a real sense of kind of like, and this is where the parallel is in sport, of what got you here won't necessarily get you there, that I think is very correlative here. And so Ashton, I think as a defending Olympic champion in a sport like, geez, decathlon, where you have to be a master of so many things, how, how did you approach London and those games versus um, you know Rio and, and back-to-backing that? London was my first Olympics. I was young, and I approached it uh, kind of like selfishly, if you will. I was like, man, I want to try to get this. Um, and I think I was just kind of going off of my talent and it, it just being a young athlete with the skills and kind of like on this trajectory. Um, and when I won that gold medal, it was kind of another four-year cycle. And uh, at, at that time, I was the best. And I was like, man, how do I keep this going? Like, how do I win in Rio? And for, so for on one side of it, the motivation initially was this is something that I want. Um, and then as I got older and more mature and in my mind, I was like, wait a minute, who am I actually doing this for? And switching it from a motivation, this isn't about me. This is actually about the kid on the couch like I was who got inspired by an athlete um, to push through or do something different or try something new. And 
so that was helpful on the motivation side. On the tactical side, I approached my sport uh, what I would call like a scientist. So I was always asking the question, what am I capable of? And in order to answer that question, uh, I had to not only try different things, but try to push my body beyond what I thought it could do. And this is something I learned actually from coaches in my life who would say, you can do this thing. And I was like, I'm not sure I can do that. And over time of trying, basically, and listening to their belief and trying to believe in myself to do that, um, I just put myself in very hard situations to see if I could answer that question. It's a very weird, um, I guess, like mindset, but it, it was try to answer this question, and the only way to do that is to try to push your own limit. Um, especially when you're competing kind of like against yourself. Obviously, there's other competitors, but as a company who's been at the top of the game for so long in kind of the tech space, uh, you know, how do you keep continue to do that is the question. And I think it's experimentation, maybe a little bit of risk taking, like, hey, I'm going to try something that I don't think is going to work out and be okay with that. Uh, it's not always about I'm going to go to this meet and do this thing and win. It might be this third place that I got because I tried something might actually help me learn uh, for the big show down the road. Well, it sounds like being really willing to put yourself in the discomfort. Yeah, I mean, yeah. ultimately, it was winning Rio was not like I doing the same thing was not going to get me to win uh, Rio, and I didn't know what I needed to do, but I know I needed to try things to figure it out. And doing that is extremely uncomfortable. Um, and you know, sometimes it wasn't just continuing to repeat the intervals that I did. I had to you know adjust something in training. It's like, man, not going with my bread and butter. Um, are you sure that's the right idea? And it's like, yeah, you actually learn something, you gain a strength in an area, and it ends up being better. Mm -hmm. So it was just a lot of experimentation and trying to find the things that worked and uh, being okay with not only being uncomfortable not doing the thing that you think you should do, um, but also you know, kind of pushing yourself and putting yourself out there even if you might fail, which I understand is a very hard thing for a company that's so public and touches so many people being able to put yourself out there and say, we're going to try this thing. Um, we don't know how we're going to, you know, what the rea reaction is. You could be very risk averse uh, later in the game. And I tend to believe that if you can push that a little bit more, um, that's how you move forward. At least that was my experience. Missy, Angela, anything from that in terms of like how you've been able to, like just the mindset, I guess, really around like bettering your best. Um, and also looking at like, how do you innovate when you're the best at something? Like, how do you innovate when you literally get to step off the podium and be like, mic drop, I'm the best in the world at that thing, which very few people get to say. Um, how do you continue to better your best knowing that, like, you want to continue to push? I mean, Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni, right? She beat her own world record six times over and over and over again. She's constantly finding those inches. Um, just curious about your guys' approach in that. Well, one of my favorite things about swimming, and I think about sport in general, I think that these two would agree, at least in my opinion, there's no such thing as a perfect swim race. Like, I don't think that exists. And so I remember I used to say that my last day on the pool deck would be the day where I felt like I wasn't learning anything anymore. And I ended up getting injured, so that was irrelevant. But that concept really remained of every time I swam, I wanted to learn something and I wanted to take something away from a race. The irony of it is it was always the bad races that I learned the most from. And I think we live in a culture where there's almost this fear around mistakes and failure. And especially now as a parent of a young child, something I'm trying to do is not have her avoid these things, but have her do them and then learn how to use them. You know, when we do make mistakes, when we fail, which is going to happen, you know, it's going to happen when you work at a company like this and you're constantly pushing boundaries and pushing limits. It's going to happen when you're striving for big and important things in your life. How do we then use those to make us better and to help us grow versus leaning into that maybe bit of shame or disappointment and not wanting to look at it. And the reference I used earlier was from Lindsay Vaughn and I loved it because she talked about in her book, she would watch every single one of her crashes. And that just resonated so much with me because I'm like, I watch race video and it's like, oh yeah, you know, like my stroke could have been a little different. She's going 84 miles per hour into a wall, right? Like it's just direct, like I can't even imagine having to watch it and relive it but she watched every single one like she had to ask her coaches to keep filming because they would stop and she's like no I need to watch so I can see 
what I did wrong so I don't do it again. Mm. And I think just that kind of mindset, no matter how long you've been somewhere, no matter your tenure, whether it's your first day or your millionth, if you can have that mindset of constantly being open to growth, not only in your disappointments and your failures, but also your successes, it's just going to put you in such a place where you're constantly approaching things from a different perspective, a different lens, and you're always going to be striving to be that best version of yourself. And in my mind, that in and of itself self is just a huge success yeah there's something really beautiful too in the like there's the yard sale failure where like every piece of equipment and limb goes flying and then there's actually Lindsay who had to learn how to actually crash well right so that she could get back up and keep going that I just think I, that mentality again of, of an athlete like we you like you have to embrace the failure so much because you know you're going to learn from it and it's a necessary evil to finding the better version of yourself yeah I used to coach hockey camps um for many years, and I had a, a rule, um, and these are kids, um, when someone falls, you, you get stick taps. Because if you think about a hockey player, the, the further you can get on your edge to, to test your edge, literally, then you know where your edge is. And if you fall, it means you've pushed beyond your edge. And they know exactly what that break point is. Wow. And so as soon as a kid would fall, it'd be like, tap the whole, I'd make the whole, everyone tap and what are we doing we're, we're actually Celebrate. congratulating failure that's crazy but back to your point of like we'll fail early and often make it part of the culture make it okay to like reset right after you win okay we got four years what, what's the plan how do we reset um you know and if you learn that late in life that's harder than if you can learn that it's okay to fail early and often and this whole clay christensen is one of my favorite sort of authors and i took a class by him when i was at harvard Disruptive innovation. I mean, he literally is like, fail. Like, that is the whole point. I think the Olympic mindset, the growth mindset, it's all the same thing. It's like, knowing if you want to be better, you have to, like, take a step back to go forward. You have to, like, watch the game tape or the crash tape. You have to just be okay with not being okay because then you know where that edge is and yeah. you can you can push. And so you're in the game, you're like, oh, I can, I can get a little lower on my stride or I can push a little harder. Um, I'll tell one quick story. Before the World Championships, I think it was like 2008, we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, well, actually, we were training in Colorado Springs, altitude, like you're dying. And our coach just killed us. I mean, talk about line drills. People were passing out, probably wasn't legal at this <laughs> point, but like people were passing out, I mean, throwing up. It was just one of those situations where you were like, I've never been pushed harder in my entire life. A week later, we go to the World Championships, and we had lost to Canada in an earlier match. We ha basically, we ha it was a must-win situation, and you knew exactly the, how tired you were relative to the week before. We, I'm not even kidding you. We stood the entire game. There's so much adrenaline wow. and understanding that your legs don't hurt. You're not your, even at the bottom. Your legs hurt last week. Right now is cake. This is yeah. easy. And so, again, I wouldn't have known that. Our team would have known that if we hadn't been pushed so hard. And so it's trying to find, to me too, it's also curious what you guys think, especially with mental health, and I know that's a big for you, like how do you balance the two? Mm. Because you really need to push yourself to know that edge, but you sometimes it's too much. Mm -hmm. You that's know, and how do you balance the two? It's a question totally. I'm still asking myself. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I would say, and it's something I think we all struggle with, not just as Olympic athletes, but with people, and it's giving yourself grace when those mistakes and failures do happen. Cause I think when they happen and you go too far on the too hard of your, I have to analyze, I have to figure out what went wrong. How can I make this kind of mistake? That's when it can kind of spiral into, and especially if it is with something where a lot of your identity and your self-worth is based in, that's when it can really kind of take on a life of its own. But if you can look at those mistakes, those failures, those disappointments, and speak to yourself as if you would your best friend or your sister or a loved one and say, you know what, this happens. I did my best. I made some mistakes, but guess what? I'm learning from them. I'm doing what I can with them and I'm going to make it better moving forward. But I think that grace piece is hard. It's something we all struggle with. If we have high aspirations for ourselves and big beliefs and what we can do and what we're capable of, when you don't live up to that, it's hard and it's frustrating and it's challenging. But I think again, with the practice of just the way you speak to yourself and the grace that you give while knowing you're doing everything you can in that situation, 
that's all we can really ask of ourselves. I'm just curious, did that voice, you guys are multi-Olympians, multi like multiple Olympic games, right, a a across the three of you. Um, so I was a one-time Olympian. So the, I have a very visceral memory of the voice and the narrative that was in the back of my mind for my period of the Olympic Games. Did the voice change for you as you moved through cycles, as you became a wiser Olympian, I would say, and as like the greenness of getting to the Olympics wears off and now you're becoming a very mature Olympian, right? Like, did that voice change for you? Was it the same? Like, you know, you talk about giving yourself grace because I, I think there is something. We all have like the, you know, the voice um, and learning how to channel that for performance is like that is the ultimate hack, right? Mine, my experience, I think, was probably a little different mm. because my experiences didn't get better as they went along. Mm. My first Olympics was my best. I was 17 years old, and I had the dream Olympics, and that was where I won the majority of my medals. And it's my, I got a tweet from Justin Bieber, which is my... Uh, yes. <laughs> so, like, every 17-year-old's dream. <laughs> and, you know, so it was, it was amazing. But I was 17. You know, I was naive in a good way. Like, I, I was just there and I was so happy to be there and I was just going out and having fun when Rio came around it was just a completely different story and I love this because I'm seeing one of the questions on the screen that's being at the Olympics puts a lot of pressure and stress on athletes it's like trying to meditate in a mosh pit <laughs> and it, it's so true and in terms of how you handle the pressure I think a huge mistake that I made going into Rio was I I did not have that grace yeah. for myself. I had put so much pressure on myself. There was so much external pressure because now it was my second Olympics. Not only was I supposed to even just make the team, which is an accomplishment in and of itself, I was supposed to go and get five gold medals. I was supposed to do better than how I did at my first. And just this immense pressure. But for me, I didn't want to disappoint people. And so for the first time in my life, I stopped swimming out of love for the sport and started swimming out of fear of disappointing people that had supported me and that wanted me to succeed and do well. So I kind of almost had the opposite that the further along I got, the harder it was for me to have grace with myself. And that grace came in my kind of recovery process. And as I went through the healing from that journey and after my retirement, but that's why we talk such a huge part about having that one thing not be your whole identity and your whole self-worth because when something like that happens and it feels like it's taken away with you, you're kind of left with this feeling of like, what do I have to offer the world other than going a 20406 and a 200 backstroke, right. you know? <laughs> and it's, it's such a journey to have to go through and figure out. So mine is a little different in that way that I actually, it, I didn't really get that kind of experience and wisdom as I went along. I actually struggled as well. I and progressed. actually the wisdom you got for your life, yeah. you know, is actually the win, right? Yeah. Um, I would say I went the other way a little bit when I was younger. I, I, like I said, it was a little bit more selfish and, you know, my narrative was like, I'm going to try to win this. Um, I should. Like, my aspiration and expectation was to try to do that. And as I got older, um, I was asking, why am I doing this? And still kind of asking, what am I capable of? Uh, and it was just more for the love of the sport. In fact, in, in Rio, in kind of the competitions after London, I didn't really care uh, what my placement was. It was just try. And, you know, my personal question, it, it wasn't necessarily a medal. It was, am I, if I'm going to figure out what I'm capable of, I'm just going to push myself as hard as I can. Whatever happens uh, is what it is. And I'm doing it for the love of it. And I'm doing it because um, I think that if I have this, like, gift or talent and I can inspire and share it with the world, it is, like, my duty and responsibility to try to take that as far as I can and, uh, you know, do it with, like, a, a, a grace and not really care about necessarily the outcome. It's just as long as I tried, I feel good about it. And I think in that way, it, it helped me already feel like a winner by the time I got there. Um, and so Rio was, it was harder physically, but I think it was better mentally because I was more embracing the athletes. I was like, hey man, how's your competition going? Um, I really care about you and I think you're doing great. Oh. <laughs> um, and, but just all athletes in general, you know, I would watch swimming and I would watch some of these other sports and just be in awe of people who were really good at what they did, and I understood the choices they had to make in life in order to be there. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It was just something where I almost got emotional just being able to be part of it mm -hmm. and uh, kind of already felt like a winner in that regard. 
That's cool. And then you actually won. So. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but maybe that, that grace of like, I, like I, I, I'm, a, I'm an extremely competitive person. <laughs> and so again, I'm trying like know. hell. And, I, and I, I still debate this. I'm like, what is competition about? And I think it's, I'm using other people's, I'm using other people to help m me better myself. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully we can all try to do that together. And so when I watch other people better themselves, I'm like, heck yeah, man. Like that is so cool. I'm proud of you. Now I want to try. Yeah. I think I can do that. I believe that I can do that. Um, let's see. So yeah, it's, it's still competitive, but it's more now as I, as I have gotten older, like a collective thing. You're going to be a great manager. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky I had four Olympics. So um, it's funny. My career was similar where we got the gold when I, I was the youngest member of the 98 team. First time we were ever in the Olympics. I'm running around with the flag on the ice. <laughs> and I, won, I, I went back to high school actually that year. <laughs> like, call it, have a senior year. I mean, um, and then we got the silver, which was a huge disappointment in Salt Lake because we should have won the gold. We were actually the better team that year, um, unlike the Nagano. But I, if I could sort of generalize, every Olympics, I think I got smarter, mm. and I knew when I was taking shortcuts. I think that's the biggest thing, because you know what good looks like then. So as I got older, I had to really critically think, do I love this? Do I want to keep doing it? Do I want to keep? And again, there were times where I'm like, ah, I think I'm done. And when I looked inside, I'm like, no, I'm st I still love this sport. But then I also knew what I needed to do. Hmm. And so I got smarter in terms of my training. That's this whole growth mindset. You have to. But you, so you know when you're taking shortcuts. I think that was almost like, then you know what kind of work you need to put in to be successful and be the best. Um, but if I had to boil it down to one thing, we keep talking about it. It's, to me, it's joy. Hmm. Like you are great at things in life when you have joy in your heart, when you love what you're doing. Because what you're able to do, in my opinion, the, I was the best player um, when I just played and I wasn't listening to the crowd or listening to little voices in my head. Or, and the analogy I use for hockey, and you guys ever played bubble hockey? You know, like foosball? Anyway, hockey's got this like translucent like bubble around it. I'm like, that's kind of me. Like, mm -hmm. you're on the ice, you're sort of aware of what's going on, you can sort of hear what's going on. Like, you're present, but you're present. You're like on the ice. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, I, it's kind of like jazz. It's like in the flow. If you can, like, you, you probably were in that when you were winning. You were a kid. You're like, woohoo, me. You know, you're just there and you're not overthinking it. So for me, mm -hmm. it was a combination of just like getting smarter about training and knowing, okay, I got to do the work. Um, but also just like always trying to remember the, f like, how did I get the into joy. flow? Yeah. Just you gotta have joy. Totally. It's so interesting. Yesterday we had a conversation with um, Lori, Dr. Lori Santos, who runs the Happiness Lab at Yale University. She's written some incredible books. And she, the hack for happiness is like awe and joy, like maintaining those things in your life, which is so true. I think, Missy, you know, my experience leading up to the Olympics wasn't dissimilar from you. I had this very odd, I, I put so much pressure on myself to make the goal that I'd had for nine years, to make the dream come true. And a lot of it was outside of me. I didn't want to let other people people down. I didn't want to like fail my family. I didn't want to, my coach, like these people that had sacrificed for me. Right. And, and the harder I tried, the worse I performed. It was the complete inverse of flow. It was like, I started to panic and the, it felt like the harder I worked, the worse my performance was. Um, but I was so stuck in it that to really unwind myself from that mindset was very difficult. And it, it was, it was, there was a breaking point where literally I had to kind of get, come to grips with like, oh, this just might not happen. And I remember my dad saying to me at some point, you know, okay, life will go on. We'll just go fishing. And I was like, I do not fish. And <laughs> he was like, that's the point. We will learn how to fish or do whatever you want to do. You will still be a live, breathing, wonderful human that will be able to engage in the world. It'll be okay. Like the pressures are not so severe that we won't survive them. And that was the first step in me flipping the mindset. And then the other part was um, my hack was, and I want to get into this in terms of like mental um, just skill sets and kind of t tr tricks of the trade, but I really put myself in the mental state of 
starting to behave as though I was on the Olympic team versus trying to make it. It's a totally different mindset, right? And I really put myself in the place of, I am on the 2004 Olympic women's rowing team. The only mistake I, I say I made is that I did not identify the color medal that I wanted to win. I think if I'd said I was on the gold medal women's team, we would have won gold instead of silver. Um, but, um, but it was a total shift because rather than tr being an athlete trying to make it, I was behaving, I was living every single day of my life as the athlete who I wanted to become. So I ate my oatmeal that way. I drove my car in that mindset. I like stretched at the boathouse in that mindset. It was a very big shift and I've used that in my business life. So I, I want to hear a little bit about that. Like the, the mindset, like I have definitely manifested my career in a lot of ways, right? Like I put myself in the mindset of like, what is it going to feel like when I'm like, doing this type of job, having these types of like engagements with people and like getting to see the world in this way. Like I've done that work. I'm curious for you guys, like the mindset that you had in Olympian and now that you've transitioned into the world, like what have you taken with you that I think we often take for granted because for years we lived in that, that training world. Uh, that just brought so many different things to mind. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, but you said everything so beautifully. And one of the first stories I thought about that was just, again, the impact of visualization mm. was for Rio in 2016, Katie Ledecky wrote down her goal times on a pull buoy, which is something we use. You put it between your legs and you just pull so you can't kick. But she had it in every single practice, right? She pulls out her gear, she pulls out her pull buoy, and she looks at these times. She went all of those times to the minute in Rio. And her first thought was, what if I had made those times one second faster? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, and that's just, that's the Katie mm -hmm. mindset. That's the Olympian mindset. mindset. But I think that's true. It's like that power of, wait a second, if you tell yourself and really believe that you can do something, why can't you take that even once? Like, who are you to set those limits on yourself? Like, cause I think when we truly believe that we're capable of doing something and we visualize it every day and we work towards it every day, there is so little that can stop us. And you mentioned Gabby Thomas earlier. They, after she won gold, they asked her, you know, how does this feel? And she was like, how I expected it to, you know, like, I when it. I visualized winning a gold medal, this is exactly how it felt like. It. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think when we can really do that and the importance of manifesting and something that really helped me, which I actually still do to this day, which I love, and it's on a much more small scale, but I think it's helpful for, for everyone is I kept a, I called a confidence journal. So after every hard practice, after every good set, after a mistake that I learned from and took something away from and became better, I would write it down. And before I got to my big meets, I would take out this journal and I would go through months of moments that brought me confidence and that brought me excitement and preparation, knowing that I could not be any more prepared for this moment than I am right now. And so I think with that mindset of setting goals, being very intentional with your goal setting, but also taking the time to visualize them and really believe that these are things you can do and they can accomplish and then breaking it down for the small steps of, all right, I have the goal now, but tangibly, how do I actually get there and what can I be doing every single day to get one step closer to it? And I would even challenge you guys to think about permanent ink versus pencil. What are you willing to write in permanent ink? And think about the like the psychology of that action versus when you write something down in pencil that's a goal. It's a totally different thing. When you can't erase it, you know, it's a different conviction and commitment. Yeah. Or telling someone else about it too. Yeah, totally. Anyone else? Uh, man, so many things there. The, the, the <laughs> word I keep hearing a lot is um, visualization. And I think ultimately it is about a vision. And, uh, you know, where you personally are trying to get to, where your team's trying to get to, you know, as people in this company. And in sport, it's, I actually feel like it's relatively easy in some ways to have a vision because it's a very obvious, like, medal or um, time or that kind of thing. In our context, in the working world, maybe it's sometimes a little bit more ambiguous. Um, but having a concrete vision definitely helps. And then once you have that, I think it's, um, the mindset that I had was, what are the things necessary in order for me to achieve that? And um, basically, if I ever came to a situation where I had to uh, ask that question, I would just say, is the thing that I'm about to do going to contribute to me getting, achieving this thing, yes or no? And if it was no, I didn't do it. Like we didn't you know, drink alcohol at all mm -hmm. for four years, from like London to Rio. Um, we stayed away from like, like just the small little things um, because it was 
and this is another thing, you have to want it, whatever it is, the vision, and then you have to want it. And I think just a byproduct of that, something that we do take for granted as athletes sometimes is just how obsessed we were uh, because it was so clear and we wanted it so bad. Um, and so bringing that, you know, to today, it is about, you know, creating that personal vision and goal, telling people, and then, um, be, you know, you learn more, you get smarter as you go along about how to achieve that and uh, trying to say, Even what I am, is what I'm doing right now going to help me achieve this, yes or no? And if no, then generally just don't try to do it. I love following up to gold medalists. <laughs> <laughs> What they said. <laughs> no, it's real. It's funny how similar your thinking is, right? Yeah. Like, as an, it's sort of, well, how the heck did you get there? Um, whatever goal it is in life, I, I used to walk around with a, a hockey card in my wallet um, of the men's hockey team because there was no Olympics for our women. Mm. Isn't that weird? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but my parents were like, "Okay, honey, like we're gonna support you." Know, you know, they let me dream. I'm gonna play for the LA Kings. Okay, honey, like <laughs> we're gonna support you know, they didn't burst my bubble. Yeah. So I had the same thing you had you know, we yeah. all had like I had the rings in the back of my head, my my whole childhood for whatever reason. And um yeah, I couldn't I can't underscore what you've just heard. Manifestation, visualization. And in a team sport, I think I think I'm the only team athlete here. No, I was in a team sport. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah four, <laughs> sorry. I always think, erg, Eight. erg, erg, erg. Um, <laughs> you're, you know, you have to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. and, so, and there's so much miscommunication sometimes. What it is, how we're going to get there, what role you're going to play. There's like this extra layer of complication to success than if it's just you individually. Because you could, you know, be ro rowing in the wrong direction or, you know, I could put all the pucks in the net, but... Um, we need everyone. So there's this like, I always say life is a team sport. Business is a team sport. To do anything in this world, you need others. You can't just do it yourself. And just, so the idea of manifestation in a collective setting, I'm so interested in like how, again, you got to see it first. You got to commit to it. You got to put the plan together. You got to love it, bring all the joy. But like, but then everyone has to do that. Yeah. And that's really hard sometimes. Yeah. So communicating that, you know, Having sayings on your wall, you know, I'm I'm big on, totally. on all of that stuff. I love that. I, I I always say, and I know hockey will say this too, but I say that rowing is the ultimate team sport. You can't get over the finish line without all nine people in the boat, including the coxswain. Um, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Like you can be pulling your brains out, but if you're not doing it in perfect unison with all other eight people, you will go backwards. Well, also, it's in hockey, it's easier yeah. to blame. You're like, ah, <laughs> oh, the goalie let in the you know, you yeah. can't tell in rowing. <laughs> right. Well, it's true, and actually, there is something around that where you're like, could I hide my performance? And I think that can happen in teams. Like there is a there's a you cannot hide your performance. In rowing if you have a really good coxswain because her job is to watch the puddles and she can tell who's slacking just by your puddle size. I mean, there's nuance in every sport. No one can hide. But I do think there's something around one of the big things that I've taken from the, the sport into the workspace is once you have the vision as a team, like, yeah, it is the job of the company to galvanize us, to rally the troops. Like, we are going to meet this AI moment, right? Okay, now it's everybody's job to, to, like, to interpret that into, like, what does that mean in the team that I'm in, in the functional day-to-day -day of the work that I'm doing so that I feel like I have a meaningful part in this? Yeah. And I think it's the galvanization around that common goal that has to happen. And then the second part is you can only control what you can control, and that is you. Like, the other thing is just setting everybody else up for success to go, you know, skate the puck down the, the ice or to, you know, row the boat in the way that they're going to row it. And really having that trust and respect of your team members is what I have found. Like, the best performing teams are the ones where they're like, I know what your job is. I trust you implicitly. You got you. I got me. But we are all, like, running towards the same thing. And I would say recognition for the bench warmer, recognition totally. for the goal score. Like you all have a part to play. And I found the hardest teams, again, just an overanalyzing teams, when everyone wants to score the game winning goal, you get the silver medal, <laughs> 2002. <laughs> totally. But when you're genuinely happy f f and congratulate the fourth line player that had a killer two minutes of ice time the whole game. I love that. Oh my God, everyone's, you, you genuinely appreciate everyone's roles and responsibilities. I, I yeah. think sometimes you don't communicate enough to everyone. Yeah. A lot of the times the star player gets all the recognition totally and agree. awards. So I couldn't agree more. It's just, yeah. how do you then put those into Pull your business through. practice too, moving it to, I mean, I run a company, it's the same thing. You're just, 
It's like everyone has to contribute at the end of the day. Everyone, totally, and you have to trust that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the audience for some Q&A. So if you've got some questions, please stand up at the mics. Um, I'd love to address them. We'll get to the Dory, too. There's one that kind of ties into one of the questions in the Dory from Kevin. Um, and it, it's picking up on a thread that all three of you just mentioned, which is like, you know, when you're manifesting a goal, like so many of us, the, the dream began when we're children. Like how many are, you know, we're all parents up here, right? Like part of the thing that I've loved is watching my like now six-year-old believe that he's Spider-Man, like fully believe that he is Spider-Man and take that on full bore from the age of like three to six. We're just transitioning out of that. Um, but it's that belief that I think actually like nobody told a kid like, hey, here's how you form a dream. Here's how you write your goal down. They just had unabated belief that it might be possible right and like no and then they just had somebody who wasn't going to say that no it's not right like the fact that you were able to dream of I want to be on the Kings one day and like there's no professional women's hockey there's never been a woman in the NHL let alone the Olympics when you started your dream like those things are so important and I think the mistake that I see as we get older is we put those self-limiting beliefs on ourselves that we never did as children right and so if you think about like Ashton I'm so curious about you going into the decathlon which is like all the sports in one um like the way I found rowing was because I really tried swimming and was not phenomenal. I definitely had zero hand-eye coordination, but I tried them all, um, you know. And then eventually, I found the one that clicked. As adults, we stop trying things on sometimes too, in order to figure out what might click. I think it, for me, the for me it came, comes down to like two simple things. I'm a very curious person in general, um, and I think it's like I'm, I'm like I want to discover. And, uh, and so I try. So it's like, I ask a question, is this possible? Uh, what is this about? I wonder if, and then, uh, or can I? And then I just try. And that was, and actually continues to be the process in my life. I mean, I retired, uh, I worked at a company for a little bit, and I was like, man, I really, in engineering seems interesting. I wonder if I can, got an engineering degree, like, I don't care if I have to start over. I'm like 36 years old in the classroom, you know, learning heat transfer. Um, <laughs> which sucks, but uh, you know, it's, <laughs> and so it, to me, it's like this discovering again, what you're capable of discovering just like more about life. Uh, you guys are in such an interesting spot. Like AI is going to completely change and has already in a lot of ways. And it's like, you don't have the answer. Actually the way to get the answer is to push. Like you're trying to answer it. So you ask the question, what is this future for us? Um, what can we do? And then you try to answer it, and that's like actually the cool part when you get your answer. Like, I can do it. Sometimes you get the answer I can't. Like, that's okay. Um, you try something else. So uh, that's what, like moving away from sport. It was actually natural for me. I wanted to because I was so curious about other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, you said everything beautifully. I, I, I just, I don't know. It's like being up here with the most well-spoken humans that have ever existed. I'm like, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, and Kate, to your point too, I just, I love the idea of not being afraid to try new things on and constantly being able to do that. And that was for me starting the podcast this year. Mm -hmm. I've always been the one being interviewed. I've never been the one doing the interview. And as scary as that was, you know, my co-host and I, we were like we don't know if we're going to be good at this. Like we, we've never done, but what did we do? We started interviewing we people. Started. Like you just start. And I think that that was just such an amazing example to me that, you know, it, it's never too late. There's never a point in your life. And it actually can be so beneficial because as we've touched on briefly here, when you have that one thing, whether it's your job or your family or your sport that really does take up most of your identity and who you are, sometimes the best thing to do is, is to spread that out and figure out what else am I? What, what else am I passionate about? What else do I have to offer? And to start doing these different things. And it doesn't mean you're any less committed or any less passionate about the work that you're doing, but it can help in your understanding of who you are and what you care about and the difference that you want to make. And so not being afraid to try something and maybe be bad at it, but also maybe be great at it. Like you, you have no idea what's going to happen. So that was just a huge lesson for me in that it was so fun trying something brand new at this point in my life and the way that it's given back to me already has just been incredible. So I think it's just set a really nice standard for the future of I hope that never ends. I hope that drive to try new things and put myself in sometimes scary situations and not know what the outcome is going to be, but to just try anyway. Yeah, I love it. Um, I'm just going to keep going until people stand at the mics with questions. Um, we have about five minutes left. Go, go ahead. 
Uh, first, thank you all for being here. My teammate and I actually skipped our other panel to come listen to you guys speak again. <laughs> uh, and also, Missy, uh, my teammate, who may or may not be in the back of this room sitting in the last row, loves you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Love it, fellow backstroker. Uh, but no, I, I appreciate so much of the, the insights and experience that the three of you have shared today, the four of you have shared mm -hmm. today. Uh, a month ago, I had never watched uh, women's rugby sevens. And then a month later, I'm like tearing up as they win the bronze medal. Um, I'm a big believer. We, we work in the marketing tech, so we're constantly kind of talking technology, AI, all these different things. But also in the, under the marketing umbrella, like what does a good story look like? I think that we're like at such an interesting time of how athletes are able to kind of take control of their narrative, their stories, use these platforms. And so I'm curious, you know, what are things that stick out to the four of you? You know, how does that kind of inspire, maybe motivate you guys to, to share or tell uh, parts of your stories or experiences from the Olympics and beyond after your competitive career has ended? Uh, and are there any athletes that you think are doing it really well? Are there any platforms or tools that you guys want to utilize? Really just how you take even greater control of the narratives and stories you want to share. Did that. you work with Alona Meyer then? As we did. Asking? So yeah. we worked with Missy. Yeah, Actually, this is a good question for me because you know we sponsored Team USA yeah. this year and yeah. I'm incredibly proud of the company. I do want to address this. Like, we might not have get, got, you know, nailed the narrative on Gemini in our creative, but we, we did an exceptional job at integrating into the storytelling with the athletes on the ground in Paris. Missy was one of our athletes oh. um, and partnership has been like phenomenal. We worked with Alona Meyer as well. And, and to that point, even the way in which she incorporated her sister, her family, her story totally. into those pieces, I think were really well done. Well, and a lot of us, like I didn't have those tools when I was competing at all. There was no like owning my own narrative. I mean, for you guys, I'd be curious to hear. Well, I, I think that that's exactly the biggest shift. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I retired in 2010. You could not go direct to consumer. It's like we were early on social media platforms. I had to wait for a brand to activate or a, a marketing person or a, the media and the fact that athletes can go direct to consumer and own their narrative and mm. tell their story and share who they are and be authentic. And I think that's why women are, are emerging in the sports industries. They're like, hey, look, I'm vulnerable. Here's who I am in a way that the men maybe aren't as much. Um, I think men are more incentivized to win the contract and get the ball across the line because there's big dollars over there. Women are like, oh, I make my money off the field. Mm. It's like a so there's, eco there's an economic mm -hmm. thing here, but um, I couldn't agree more athletes are just changing the power dynamic is shifting and in, in favor of the athletes finally in a way that we that we didn't have right no. um and maybe you had a little touch of but just a few years later they can they can talk to their fans they can be authentic they can they can drive product right at the end of the day and that's super exciting i think for from an athlete's perspective yeah, I mean, you hit the word I wanted to say, which was authenticity. I think when we have these platforms and when we're able to share our stories and our voices, the importance of partnering with companies that respect that authenticity and that do it in such a way where I'm filming a shoot with Google on the ground in Paris and I'm using tools that you offer that I actually use every day. And it's just, it feels so real because it is. Because it, it, it's honest and it's authentic. And so I think that's when athletes truly shine. And I think that's when we all really connect to the athletes is when we see them and we, you just know, like that's real, that's who they are. I think that's why the stars that we've seen doing so well using their platforms and using social media, it's because they're genuinely just being who they are. Yeah. And then working with groups and companies and brands and sponsors that see that and encourage that and support that and aren't in any way trying to make them different than who they are. They're just amplifying what the athlete already offers. And I think, us as consumers, us as companies that sponsor these athletes can just appreciate that. And that's when a relationship is so mutually beneficial is when it just feels so genuine from both sides. Um, well, we'll have time to get your, your question, I hope. Um, the, Cause they both said authenticity um, for sure. And I think the reason is because that works and we like it is because it's very easy to dehumanize athletes. You see mm. them on the television or whatever, and it's like, oh, they must do X, Y, Z in their life. But when you actually see them on the human side, you're like, they're actually like me. And as a young athlete who yeah. went uh, to compete in, against people that I idolized, I was like, oh, my God, I'm never going to be able to be at that level. And then when I was next to them, I humanized them. I was like, oh, we're like actually not that much different. They're like complaining, too, and doing this stuff. So that is, <laughs> I think, the really cool part. Um, and I think somebody who's doing it really well on the track and field side is actually Noah Lyles. Uh, he uses actually YouTube, so there's an opportunity yeah. there, uh, a lot. And um, he's very authentic, uh, very humanizing, and telling a story very well on his own. Thank you. Cool. 
Hi. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, all three of you reached like the pinnacle of your sport, obviously being at the Olympics. When you had to transition out of comp competing, how did you kind of evaluate now like, oh, now your life is kind of like a full reset mm -hmm. from competing and chasing whatever goal you had? How did you approach then like just figuring out that next step? The very first thing I did was um, put myself in an environment that I wanted to be in, which I learned this from college, uh, coming in as a high school athlete into the track and field team. I was just around people who wanted the same thing and were very good and driven. And so I learned a lot from them and the, the coaches. I was very interested in science and tech, so I like moved to Silicon Valley to try to be around that. Um, and then network like crazy and basically spend time um, being a beginner and learning. Uh, that was basically phase one. First thing I did was cry. <laughs> a lot, there was a lot of crying. Uh, it's a really hard transition, right? Because, you know, I think something I've learned since retiring is I will never have the same feeling of winning a gold medal and hearing my national anthem play. I will have moments that feel even more incredible than that in different ways, but they're not gonna feel the same as that moment. And just coming to peace with that, you know, like that's, that's okay because now I have the moments of my daughter doing something incredible or my husband doing something that inspires me so much that give me that same sense of just awe and love and joy, but kind of recognizing there may not be something that feels exactly like that and that's okay where else can I find those other moments? So I think during that transition, I leaned so heavily on my support system because we spoke about this earlier. One of the most difficult things about that transition is it's not like a slow ease out of it, right? You're, you're done. Like this thing that was a part of your life for so long that you trained four to six hours a day, it was your lifestyle. It's not like, oh, we're gonna go some three days a week now and then two and then one and like, we'll help you. It's like, this, this is it. And so I think with that, leaning so heavily on my support system and then as Ashton said, then the networking comes in and you really have to start digging deep and ask yourself the question, what else am I passionate about? How else do I wanna to continue to make a difference and make an impact? Where are those areas? Who do I know in those areas? Because I know I have skills from my career and from this sport. I know I have work ethic and I know have, I have things that a lot of people and companies value, but I don't know how to apply those. So who can help me and where can I start? And I think it's just a very humbling experience to, to go from being the top to starting at the bottom, but still recognizing the worth and the value that you bring in those scenarios. Yeah, I think um, you have, I think you have confidence in yourself, but it's like figuring out where do you want to apply the skill set and the confidence and the things that you developed on the ice or in the pool um, or on the track or on the river, mm -hmm. on the river. <laughs> How do you want uh, to? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's really hard, just to echo again, I feel like I'm repeating, but it's it's so hard. It's like, okay, my first career, my first sporting love or whatever you want to call it. Um, I tried to, again, play, he I threw myself into business school, which was so helpful because I was just like, oh my God, I have to learn Excel. And like, ah, I was so, I was like overwhelmed in a good way. And then I flipped my mindset to like, oh my God, I can do anything I want with my time. What? I don't have to travel with my gear. Like, I can be anything I want. And everyone was like, oh, you're gonna go into coaching and broadcast, you know, everyone sort of just pushes you back into sports. And I like intentionally got out of sport. But I think it's, it's again, I'm big on like your mind. And if you see it not as like, oh, you're, you, you've, you've left the thing you've loved and yes, I still want that feeling again, but like you get to do anything. And that was my approach. Like, what do I wanna do um, now that I have freedom outside of hockey so it's a great question though every single athlete struggles with it the military i think struggles with it totally. anyone going through a career change struggles with it it's really like at your core what brings you joy and try to then go that direction one other way to frame this is what do you want to learn yeah um because sometimes it like i didn't necessarily know exactly what i wanted to do but i knew what i kind of wanted to learn and that helped me kind of figure that out yeah, I love that. um 
So if, cool. yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. I'm going to end with this quote this, that I live by. The, the most important thing at any moment is to be willing to sacrifice what you are for what you could become. I think that is a really important way to think about the little stuff and the big stuff because it, it's all about kind of the limiting things that we impose upon ourselves when you kind of like unshackle yourself from that. There's infinite possibility. So you guys, thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank you to our audience. <laughs>